So uh, tonight we have a couple of presenters. Um, I believe it was Mary who couldn't be here tonight, who is looking forward to the recording. And by the way, we are recording. So, you know, be aware of that. Uh, your, you know, your likeness in the little tiny form might be in the video. Um, uh, and your, your, your voice, your questions, your amazing questions, I'm counting on us to come up with for the end of this. Um, uh, due to one member's uh, tendency to dad joke, uh, we're going to save the questions till the end and not let, let interruptions happen. <laughs> Won't name you, Giles. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, um, I think we're all here because we read the email, uh, the invite, and Christina Milanusic and Michael Stocker. Um, we've got, uh, um, you know, live sound practitioner, thereminist, uh, master of arts student defending this summer. Woo. Um, uh, we've, we've all read, um, you know, and then of course, Giles right away called out the, uh, the, uh, Skywalker ranch bit on, on Michael's bio. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the upper, you know, the higher, higher road and, and mention the Holocaust Museum, you know, um, as, uh, you know, that was the one that got my attention. So, um, you know, um, but anyway, um, and hey, if we're all here afterwards, and we're, and the questions have died down, but we're just enjoying being together, and we're pouring ourselves a drink or something, I've got a, not a Skywalker Ranch story, but a, a great Leslie uh, story. Uh, and so anyway, um, but yeah, um, thanks everyone for being here. It's really great to see faces, especially the ones that are showing their faces. Um, if if I do mute my own camera, it'll be because I'm and my mic. It'll be because I might finish my dinner while this is going. It's totally acceptable in a Zoom call, right? Um, but very much, very anxious. Uh, and yeah, uh, circling back a little bit to this survey, um, you know what makes a great meeting? Um, I had an I had a answer that popped to my mind right away when I read that question. Um, the thing that I think really makes a meeting stand out for me is when it's something that's a little out of our usual box. Um, you know, audio comes in through a mic, through a cable, through a preamp, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These things never change. Um, uh, when I'm hearing about something like how other species are hearing, um, uh, now this is this is cracking open my mind a little bit and making me think about things from a different angle. And I always just find that to be the most, the thing that you can't explain to your boss why you could, you know, why you needed to be at this meeting or why it was, you know, professional development. That's the, that's the meetings that, that I find I get the most out of. So um, I would just like to welcome our guests and thank you for coming and take over. Stop me somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you so much for having for having us here. A huge thanks to Michael Stalker for being kind of the expert um, in this in this area. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen, and of course, thanks to Mary for making this making this happen. It, um, she's been a really wonderful person to to get to know. Um, so this is kind of uh, a little bit of an appendix to my thesis that I've been doing at, at um, the University of Lethbridge. Um, I presented at AES last year um, about this, and I'm not sure if I should be reading out the entire um, abstract, but uh, I think I was a, I'm, I am a live sound technician. I have been a live sound technician for a number of years and it wasn't really always uh, evident to me that there was infrasound and ultrasound. I was very just focused on my anthrocentric um, way of hearing. And so when I took my first acoustics class, which was a master's level acoustics class at the U of L, I really realized that um, there's all this sound and vibration in the in the world around us that I'm not privy to, and it may be uh, important to use our technologies so that we can better understand that sound and and um, take it into account when we're making uh, decisions that impact human life and other animal life. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the most relevant things I think, and we're going to get to talk about this a little bit uh, later, is kind of the limitations of human metrics and our own kind of biases uh, when we're when we're doing experiments and I kind of also want to say like this is me and I'm an 
artist. I'm not an ac acoustician, nor am I um, a neurotologist or a bio bio um, acoustician. I'm just a live sound theremin player um, who cares very deeply about the animal world and the and the health of our planet. Um, and then I don't know, maybe Michael wants to introduce himself a little bit as well. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much for you know, guys attending. And it looks like you've got a nice convivial group of folks that meet together on, I guess, a monthly basis. And I'm, I'm say I'm honored, pleased to be here. Um, I started out uh, wanting to be a, a, um, a marine biologist and I had aquariums all over the house. My mom would take me down to the beach and drop me into a tide pool and then she'd be done for the rest of the day because she could just crack a novel and not be bothered by me. Um, but, and I got into high school, I was really looking forward to a biology class um, and the biology teacher was had this amazing skill of being able to make biology boring. And so I fell back into music. We, we talked to Giles, the, the real musician in the room here. Um, but we, I, I fell back into music and then found shortly that the people who got paid most reliably were the people who were technicians, people who understood electronics and acoustics and whatever. And so I, I got into that uh, that field and studied uh, musical acoustics at Eastman, and I studied uh, electronics and, and magnetics at, at Caltech. And so I, I kind of for, uh, foraging around for things that intrigued me. And it really didn't come to a head in terms of what I'm doing right now until the Navy was proposing uh, projecting sound and sonifying the entire ocean so they could talk to their submarines. And I still had an interest in biology, but I had an understanding in in, um, in physics and acoustics. So I, you know, that's a very bad idea. And I decided to um, start attending these public hearings on this on this proposal in 1992, and it developed into or degenerated into this what I'm doing now, where I have a, a, a research scientific research and policy development organization. We're looking at the impacts of of human generated noise on marine habitat, and that. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to drop it there. That, that's kind of how I got to where I am right now. And I just got off, I, I might fall asleep because I got off the um, a, a boat this afternoon with, a, with 20 high school students and we were doing sounds of the bay, dropping hydrophones in and, and being out on San Francisco Bay with all that fresh air, it's fresh air poisoning. It's it, <laughs> I feel real kind of very relaxed right now. So uh, let's go on ahead. I, I think that um, Christina has really worked hard on this, uh, this presentation and um, it's, it's going to be great. And, and I, I may poke in a little bit occasionally, but I'm just uh, let, let it unfold, Christina. It's, it's all yours. Okay. So um, really what I've kind of come to the realization was, and I think this is something that Herman von Helmholtz was really talking about in the 19th century, um, who he made he was a very cool musician as well making these resonators um and definitely one of the pioneers in understanding audition and so i was reading a book called the sonic boom and came across this but it was long after i had kind of realized that sound has um very distinctive phenomena associated with it and we kind of can group these things together and it's important to sometimes deconstruct those into their actual areas so we know what part of sound and that um, uh, we're referring to so the first one is obviously acoustic energy and so this is including sounds that are you know audible and and inaudible to human beings um, and so there's a direct uh, correlation between wavelength and frequency. We can kind of see in this lovely uh, Meyer space map, um, we, we have uh, some attenuation happening. Uh, so the, the high frequencies are kind of losing their energy quickly and we can see that the low frequencies are propagating a little bit further. And so we can see the propagation of uh, with these visual visual tools and one of the one of the things that I kind of wanted to bring up too is like how we are always using these visual analogies and how maybe that's because I'm so guilty of this as well um, that's not necessarily like the best thing for us to do um, so uh, 
maybe we can use some some uh, auditory analogies rather than the visual ones. Um, but the propagation of a, acoustic energy is um, wavelength dependent, and it, uh, these sound as a physical as a physical vibration. It um, propagates through elastic mediums such as air or water as longitudinal pressure waves, and it's moving through the near and um, far fields, um, and that will have an impact on sound reception as well. Um, so it's traveling at different velocities um, and is frequency dependent. So we see here the iceberg uh, floating and the water. And so kind of investigating how these sound vibrations are traveling differently through mediums um, kind of shows that the density and temperature of the medium is is really dictating the velocity of the sound travel. So the greater the density of the medium, the faster the sound's going to travel. So the sound is going to travel much, much faster in the water, I think like almost five times faster in the water than it is in air. And um, so uh, and this is simply just because of the particles being closer together. So rises in temperature increase um, sorry, in, increase sound speed, and this can cause temperature inversions in warmer climates to occur in the evening, night, and early morning um, when a cold layer of air forms on the ground, um, on the warm ground surface. So sound then starts to bend in the atmosphere, forming these sound channels that allow sound waves to be heard over larger distances due to downward uh, refractions. And um, elephants and birds kind of make use of this and uh, whales too. This is also, like, I think, maybe when we're talking about the ocean a little bit uh, later, we can talk about how how whales are also using these kind of sound channels um, to add kilometers to their signal propagation. And I think a good analogy for this is like uh, ham, a ham radio thing. So it's a little bit like how shortwave radio operators use kind of the properties of the ionosphere at different times of the day to increase transmission rains of their transverse electromagnetic ray, uh, waves. And it, that also kind of makes me um, think about more so the vibratory spectrum rather than these kind of discrete senses uh, or like discrete, like, oh, this is a mechanical wave or this is an electromagnetic wave, but more so of the senses all working together and these kind of different waves of vibration in our in our world um, also working together. And then one thing we're going to get to a little bit later is that acoustic energy is transmitted and received through the substrate. So yes, we're hearing pressure waves in the air and that's how our hearing mechanisms are working, but a lot of um, species are actually communicating through the earth as well. And, you know, even even we talking about how the senses are kind of this aggregate thing, we're also hearing through our bones and, and feeling um, feeling sound as kind of a vibro tactical sensation. And so what we what we call sound is really what we can hear. Um, and this is typically, as I think everybody knows in this room, usually between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, but that this is going to change over the lifetime um, and uh, obviously uh, varies um, across even like, uh, yeah, it varies across the lifetime. There's also this, you know, third aspect of, of sound that we're not going to touch on in this particular presentation. I don't want to ramble too much on with it, but we do attune to, and species do this too, we attune to the sounds in, um, in our culture. So like when, when a baby is first born, they're going to hear all of these sounds and pay attention to all these sounds. But, you know, a, a, a child born in, in China versus in, um, in the US will kind of attune to like the intonations of their language. And I think that's a really interesting uh, phenomena that's not necessarily at all about acoustic energy, but kind of an aside as one of these other things. Um, that we we should consider when we're talking about sound. And so um, there's all this sound that we can't hear and we term it kind of by these like ultrasound or infrasound. So ultrasound is very short in wavelength. We're talking like, I think 15 kilohertz is um, 
2.28 centimeters in air. So that's very, very um, small. And it's typically split into three, three frequency bands. Um, uh, and the lowest band is kind of pertinent to auditory perception in a lot of non-human species like bats. Um, and then the higher frequencies of ultrasound are used in medical applications um, because of their ability to interact on a cellular level with organic tissues. And so they have imaging uh, capabilities. Um, they're emitted uh, by a lot of like devices that we have around us. So like obviously pest repellent devices, but um, yeah, but some other things, and there are a few naturally occurring sources of infrasound, but most notably are the animals that make them, such as dolphins, whales, and crickets, and, and bats, of course. Um, and some other devices, sorry to have been a little bit uh, jumping around, but some other devices are like motion detectors, washers, air compressors, cutting machines, all of these things are emitting ultrasound. Um, even sometimes, like when we snore as humans, we can, we are, we are emitting ultrasounds too. Um, so they have some deleterious effects. They can cause burns, headaches, dizziness, and nausea, loss of balance, tinnitus. Um, I think there was a 2018 study that showed that ultrasound at levels found on uh, like a university campus where they did this particular experiment had adverse biological effects on the cellular growth of yeast. So this is even affecting um, simple organisms. And uh, we're not really studying uh, these. They, no, they don't travel very far. Like they, they, are, they uh, don't go that, they don't propagate very far, but we're not really looking at um, the, the summing effects of any of these emissions. Um, especially in our daily lives. We're just putting out these technologies without really knowing. Christina, um, I'm wondering if I could yeah. follow up on this, kind of like punctuate this point. Yeah, please a do. Of, a number of us have um, uh, microwave ovens in our homes. And how that was discovered is that there was a military station, I think up in Iceland on the uh, do line, they used to call it early warning, defense early warning line. And people who were... <clears throat> Uh, stationed there after about six months, it would fall ill. And so they did a study, you know, what's what's going on here, bacterial, viral, whatever. And they had one guy up there who was kind of looking at the symptoms of this and found that these people, the symptoms were that their, their flesh was being cooked from the bones on out. And they uh, did some analysis so they had essentially um, a radio wave frequency that basically was resonating at the wavelength of uh, water particles and that, that was cooking people and this guy wisely went on to patent it and became a wealthy man on <laughs> microwaves and they, i think they stopped using it up there but just to express you know how we roll ahead without necessarily knowing the consequences until we start seeing them that would be one example of that yeah that's a pretty important important example um so at the other end of the of the acoustic energy spectrum we have infrasound and these are sounds that travel large distances they have very long wavelengths they're not easily absorbed or reflected like ultrasound is um, they're pretty much always present in the acoustic environment and emanate from a bunch of natural sources thunder ocean waves geological movements winds um, man-made sources of infrasound um, are mainly the result of industrialization. So we're talking uh, explosions, transportation vehicles, um, any sort of large machine is going to emit infrasounds, traffic. Um, and we're really perceiving infrasounds as a vibrotactile sensation, um, even when the hearing human hearing threshold isn't reached. So unlike sound in the audibility range, um, the dynamic range between like perceptible infrasound and very loud infrasound is, is like, I don't know how to express this, but it's very little. Um, 
I think the iOS 1995 was like 20 dB is what they called it, but we're, we're going to get into those metrics very soon, uh, briefly, but, um, yeah, so, and there are some adverse effects that happen with infrasound too. So alteration in hearing and time perception, alteration in blood pressure, wakefulness changes, um, it's known to cause fatigue, difficulty concentrating, confusion, headaches, decreased respiratory rates, um, and then vibroacoustic disease is caused by infrasound exposure. It's caught, it, it shows uh, thickening of cardiovascular structures in both human and, um, and animal experiments. Um, and yeah, so infrasound is kind of it's perceived through species specific mechanic mechanical uh, receptors and um, yeah we're going to talk about that very very uh, soon right right now I kind of want to talk about the like some of these human centric met metrics that we're we're using to kind of uh, measure acoustic energy in the in the environment and so this is a um, uh, just a weighting curve, a dB weighting curve, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows about uh, the decibel, but it's a relative change in sound power or pressure level, and there are a number of different um, acronyms associated with it, so DBSL, D DBSPL, sound pressure level, is comparing the human threshold of hearing which is um, about 20 micropascals to the threshold of pain, which is about 200 pascals or 140 dB. And um, so the DBA frequency weighting is really applying a loudness contour that's based on the kind of fletcher munchkin curve, which is adjusting for the resistive effects of human hearing mechanisms, um, like our tympanium and cochlea, which we'll talk um, a little bit about in the next um, uh, slides, but really the point that's most important for me to make right here is that even this, this is a pressure weighting, so it's not really talking about particle motion, um, it's really talking about air pressure, and it's very limited in its frequency band, so there's no infrasound and no ultrasound um, kind of being shown in, in this, so um, yeah, there's a lot of frequency selectivity um, involved in this, which may not be really sufficient for for knowing um, what's going on in the acoustic environment. So we have other auditory weightings like the M weighting and the I think it's the dBHT uh, weightings. So these are used to um, for like M, M weightings, I think for marine mammals, please jump in if, if you want to, Michael, but um, they're also kind of based on like these types of curves. So they will um, evaluate the effects of noise um, kind of by inserting a filter that mimics the, the assumed hearing ability of the species. And um, yeah, so it's a kind of the same concept of using the DBA weighting in humans. And you can see like, okay, so there's some, there's dBc here and maybe a dBz, which is an unweighted um, thing, but they're really, they're all tapering down. And like, when you really look at the dBa, especially like it's tapering off at one kilohertz. And and so, yeah, there's some, there's a little bit of, of uh, there's some issues with this metric for sure. And I think one of the other issues is that there's some overlap uh, between acoustics on the low end of the spectrum between um, acoustics and then like geophysicists and seismologists that are kind of dealing with these low frequency sounds. Um, so it's, you know, when we're using the DBA weighting curve, um, which we, we are for most uh, health and safety standards and policies, especially in North America, I think Europe might be slightly more uh, ahead of us here, but you know, it might not really be able to consider uh, the impact of infrasounds and ultrasounds on human health and the well being of other cre uh, creatures with different hearing ranges. Um, 
So let's talk about the fun stuff soon. Um, so let's talk more about the second part of what the physicality and phenomena of sound is. So before that's... we get, jump in there, I just want to yeah, talk yeah. about these curves just briefly. Yeah, the curve please. Is set do. up to accomplish some particular type of uh, either regulatory uh, um, guidelines or, in the case of like the DBA, having to do with reproduction of sound and in in, uh, in the sweet spot of what humans hear. Uh, but they're all uh, based on uh, behavioral responses and from the autonomic nervous system, not on a, uh, but the voluntary nervous system. So they basically do, um, can you hear this type of things? And and when they try to tailor, you know, it's like the Fletcher Munson curve, right? I mean, it's stuff that we hear. Uh, and so when you're designing audio equipment, you want to make sure that you're catering to the sweet spot there. But uh, what... Christina is speaking about is that things that are perceivable, but not necessarily in the voluntary nervous system, but in the autonomic nervous system, nonetheless uh, influence or impact our behaviors in ways that are um, outside of these particular uh, cognitive curves. So I just want to insert that. Thank you. Like it's a good point, and we need these. Like I'm not, I'm not by by any means um, judging any of these metrics. I do understand the need for for kind of these these references. Uh, I just um, um, yeah, just need to uh, make sure we are aware of the assumptions that we're making when we're doing this type of thing. Um, okay, so second part, hearing mechanisms. So I put together this estimated auditory. Um, perception ranges based on a number of like different studies uh, from over the years. So that's why it's estimated because there's different um, methods that were used in in both. Um, and, you know, I think kind of going back to this idea of, you know, hearing is is defined as the act of perceiving sound, um, but the sense of hearing can only be dis demonstrated and described through an analysis of sounds effect on behavior, which is kind of what what Michael was talking about. And so with these metrics, we really have to think about what are we assuming, because um, animals can hear very much so out of our assumptions. And so I just started a book called The Immense World that Michael so lovelyly uh, recommended to me and they were talking about this German concept called the um, um, umwelt um, and it wasn't really used to simply refer to the animals surrounding instead it was kind of um, like the part of the surroundings that the animal could sense and experience so it, it's perceptual realm so when we're doing these kinds of metrics we're assuming um, kind of what am I trying to say? We're really we're assuming based on the like we're projecting our human knowledge on them, and and um, the like for example, you'll notice the elephant it doesn't go down very far, and this is because our our tools are also limited. Like our the transducers that we're using to do these types of tests are limited, and the enclosures are limited. Um, so one of the one of the people that's a good a big name in ethology is Donald Grif Griffin, and so he he really was um, challenging this like scientific norm that that you could do these types of experiments in labs, and he really was asserting that animals should be studied in their natural habitat and the importance of that. Um, so these experimental conditions can really impact results. And so uh, I'm going to kind of give one example of of tadpoles. So we assumed tadpoles weren't able to to hear um, because we were testing them with like a damp towel around them. Um, and then um, I, I'm going to talk about him in a, another slide or two. Um, but I think his name is Bob Caprinas. And so he was an auditory neuroethologist and he was very interested in, in frog hearing. And he went through these like painstaking um, procedures where he actually put the tadpoles in water. And as soon as they were in that kind of more natural habitat of, that we started to see 
uh, auditory evoked responses. And so how did we get these, you know, estimated auditory perception ranges? Well, we do observe uh, animals in, in their natural uh, habitats, but otherwise there's essentially like two different methods. So one of them is like an operant conditioning method where you train uh, a species and you kind of reinforce these deliberate behaviors using positive or negative or punishment or extinction um, so that the kind of behavior becomes more common. Um, and again, I'm an artist, I'm not a scientist, so my interpretation of, of this could be slightly, slightly flawed. Um, but essentially the method involves training animals to perform an action such as licking a feeding tube and then when a sound signal is heard and then the frequency and amplitude of the sound signal are shifted up or down during the procedure and the animal's behavior response to shifts in tone and volume are recorded. And so that collected data will show detection thresholds for various frequencies and it can be used to create an audiogram. So this is kind of similar to the way that, you know, we do our own hearing tests when we go to see an audiologist and um, kind of say like, yeah, I can hear 8K still, but I don't know if like even, even like when I go see my audiologist, they're testing between 250 hertz and 8 kilohertz. So if the human hearing range is, you know, 20 to 20, um, those tests are still happening, like in even just like this slight little area of them. Um, and then the second, the second way we test hearing is through kind of auditory responses. So this is an electrophysical physiological um, response. So one example is the Beyer test, which is used to determine kind of for dogs and cattle and, and horse, horses up here at least, to determine if they have good auditory health. Um, and in these methods, a single trans, a signal transmission is occurring between kind of the mechanoreceptor and the ear and brain are monitored with like surface needles or electrodes. So there will be a positive and negative in the ground. And the brainwave activity is shown by monitoring the auditory evoked potentials um, or responses. Um, and then the auditory brainstem response. So they compare the input si signal of the recorded brainwave and determine kind of the equal late latency and the equal loudness co contours as well as the time of integration in both animals and humans. So uh, this method is using a noise uh, stimulus like pips or bursts of noise or um, like signal, signal frequency tones, which are not really like sounds that emerge naturally like in, in the acoustic environment, like you rarely get like a pure sine wave in the acoustic environment. So I think that's also relevant to, to point up. Um, anyway, so these tones are delivered via earphone or bone stimulation. Um, and so it's an effective way to illuminate how sound waves are traveling through the peripheral um, auditory system, but it's really representing a very specific response to nerve potentials and not necessarily like the hearing bandwidth or sensitivity for many spe species. And it's not a very good, this way of measuring auditory evoked potentials. It's not a very reliable uh, below like four kilohertz, I think. So again, when we're talking about needing to measure these low sounds, um, this might not be the, the best method, but let's um, go on to hearing mechanisms. I don't wanna dwell too, too much on this stuff. Um, so acoustical energy is moving through the environment in two ways by a pressure gradient or particle motion. Um, and so um, we can see the bullfrog up here and it's got these beautiful like tymp tympaniums. His eardrums are like literally behind his his eyes here. So that's really like a, a membrane. Um, that he's the, the he or the frog is using to kind of sense uh, sense these sound waves in the acoustic environment, um, and then so and then we have sensory hairs. So this is a zebrafish, and so 
lots of fish have what's called a lateral line and essentially um, it's like a system of hair cells that kind of are directly exposed to the to the water so the water kind of the particles in the water are moving over those sensory hair cells directly um, and so they're really um, uh, kind of sensing the acoustic energy as uh, as particle motion, but it's almost the inverse of, at least the way I understand it, is kind of the inverse of the way that uh, we're understand what we feel pressure waves in the environment. So we're kind of moving through the environment with with our ears, and I feel like with particle motion, it's almost as if the environment is moving over the animal. So um, anyway, so there's some other. Things that are involved in nerve clusters, obviously the sensory hairs are attached to these sensor, sensory neuromasts um, and uh, air filled chambers, um, membranes, and resonating cavities are some of the different ways across species that sense acoustic energy. And so I just want to talk about the human ear. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are various components of the ear that modify sound signals through filtering, um, impedance matching and amplification. And I didn't really talk that much about impedance matching, but it's it's interesting in the sense that, you know, with electronics, you need to kind of, imp you want to have a one-to-one -one impedance to have like the best transfer of energy. Um, that's not necessarily like the case with, with, sound sensing mechanisms if you like if you have um like a direct impedance match sound will just go completely through the animal um and if it's uh if there's like like the the which which is good it's absorbing um well geez i need to study this a little bit more but uh, <laughs> yeah uh it, 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 I can it, step in here a little bit. Yeah, uh, please do. Essentially, you know, we go back to our, the, the third or fourth slide where you talked about um, the way that uh, sound works through various densities. Uh, there's a speed component to this um, and also an efficiency component to the thing. For example, if I reach my hand out and scratch my desktop, I can kind of hear it in the air. But if I put my ear down to the desktop, I can hear it quite efficiently and not only mm -hmm. travels more efficiently through non-compressible the, the whole compressibility component of the thing but also um a lot faster so mm -hmm. sound travels through beryllium copper at you know forty six thousand feet per second and it travels through air at you know a thousand feet per second essentially but when you're talking about this impedance matching issue we are definitely uh a lot denser than our surroundings when you talk about fish or, or other animals in, in the ocean invertebrates or, or whales that um the the impedance match is a lot closer so the sound moves through them but there are um sensing organs within various animals of various types that actually uh, opposite uh, operate for example as accelerometers so when the fish's body is being shaken as a um in a, in a particle motion field, uh, there are accelerometers that are denser than the rest of the body, and they actually create the hearing. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of variations on this. Um, and uh, a, a, essentially, we hear through this very elegant, very Rube Goldberg affair called our hearing system with all these different transduction, the bones, the, you know, the the um the inner ear ossicles and the and the cochlea it's very beautiful how it's set up it's but it's also very complicated and um mm. i don't think a lot of other animals i mean mammals have this this uh, analogy here but when you're talking about fish um you know they're hearing their environment not necessarily i mean this is the umwelt thing that, that you're talking about they don't hear themselves uh, or they'll necessarily hear sound from somewhere they hear themselves in the sound mm -hmm. um, yeah. but the difference the distinction between particle motion and pressure gradient in the near field is that there's actually phase lag so um the the pressure gradient takes longer to kind of compress and uncompress whereas particle motion is quite direct and so in the in the near field which is like 
you know, two to two and a half wavelengths, they can determine how close the sound is because there's a, there's a phase lag in there. When it's outside of, you know, a few wavelengths, they don't care. So it, it's a different way of hearing if you're talking about threat, uh, vigilance, or what have you. Um, and you see this, you know, when there's a, a fish swimming in a frisky brook, for example, and it's a lot of noise in there. It's incredibly loud because all this activity going on. And then a little mayfly lands on top of the, um, the water. And because it projects coherent sound within the near field, it knows mm -hmm. exactly what it is. It grabs it. Yeah. So it's a different way of hearing. Um, in terms of you know vigilance and I'll just I'll just leave it at that I, yeah that's, but it's your you're on the right track Christine it's really great yeah and you know this human ear that we have is just such a f fabulous it's 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 infinitely fascinating to me like even when you just look at the shape of the pinea and like it's really um uh kind of funneling the sound in and we see this like with a lot of shapes in in you know uh, oral architecture even and then um uh like how 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 even these things um uh what was i going to say um but we have the acoustical impedance of the like it's much uh higher at the open end of the ear than it is here so this this whole mechanism here is really amplifying the sound and then um you know, so this our pinea is maybe the most pin, uh, vi uh, visible part of the ear, um, but uh, but it's just like the collector part. Um, and then we get into this kind of lever system in the in the middle ear um, and the semicircular canals that we don't really like. I don't feel like sometimes they're just left out, but these are really how we're staying up, upright and sensing kind of orienting ourselves in space. Um, those are kind of very important structures, um, really like providing our sense of, of gravity and motion. And then we go into this kind of hydro, like hydraulic cochlea, fluid filled cochlea with all of the stereocilia inside of it, which is really an interesting, um, a piece too and it's it's like it's spiral shaped and a lot of the mathematics that we use to actually kind of flatten out the vascular membrane that is in the surface of the cochlea um it's not exactly like it's like it's it's a bit of an irrational math number in my understanding so like our modeling of it isn't exactly it's not perfect so to speak um but one of the most important things is that it is tonotopic. So we have kind of lower frequencies um, at the base, at the apex here, and then uh, getting to the higher frequencies as we go like into the inside of the cochlea. And then um, all of the hairs that are in the uh, cochlea are really attached to the nerve cells that are kind of transmitting those signals to our brain. Um, kind of moving on here, I don't want to take up too much time, but most- I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually, just because we can go on this for hours and hours, just to express how complicated each part of that transfer function is from the pinna yeah. through the depth of the cochlea into the the um, the nerves. <clears throat> I'm just gonna take the pinna. And this is something that I, I learned when I was in, in the AES. There was a guy named Kurt Noppel and Kurt invented this thing called the Aphex Oral Exciter. And maybe some of you might be old enough to remember that. Um, what that was predicated on was the work of, among other people, this woman, Putty Rogers, who was down at Stanford. And she looked at, you know, why do we have these whirls in our pinna? What's going on there? Why is it shaped the way it is? And what she found is that when sound enters into the auditory matus, which is the outer ear canal in this, in this illustration here, that's the direct sound. But there is a reflected sound that reflects off the whorls of our pinna, and that creates a distortion both in terms of amplifying frequencies and in the time domain where we have a phase shift uh, that is actually kind of an apical phase shift that's centered around two kilohertz that helps us localize sound. And so we get a primary uh, through the auditory meatus, a secondary reflection off the pinna, and the phase difference at you know between 800 and 200 uh, and 2k2 
the phase distortion that happens there allows us to localize sound sources in the median plane to, to within a, a degree of accuracy. So while we're predators, we need to know where our prey is. And that is a very precise way of localizing. So what Kurt did is he basically designed this electronic thing called the oral exciter. And that basically re-accentuated that phase and frequency distortion and the way this thing was worked was really amazing. We used to use it in you know these large concert settings where you have a grand piano on the stage with you know 200 kilowatts of of sound energy on either side of the stage, and then the, the you know the feedback possibilities are, are all over. So you basically mix just a teeny bit of this uh, distortion in the piano, and because it's how we localize sound, it would punch the piano out into your face, and you could have it below the sound of all the other instruments in the band so it wouldn't feed back but it would be right in front of you so you could actually localize things with this distortion that happens that you know that putty rogers kind of sussed out and kurt Noppel exploited um and the, the way you you could just turn a little bit into it and you wouldn't really know until you got a, until you turned it off and you, then it's also wow what happened to the piano <laughs> what happened to whatever instrument you're using it on so that's just the pinup and then we can go into the rest of the stuff. But just it, the cochlea is, you know, it's a marvelous organ. So, anyways, I'm, I, I just wanted to express, you know, the complexity of each transfer function that's happening with this thing. As I said, very Rube Goldberg. Each one is incredibly complex and very well tuned to what the specific outcome is. And it's also the pinea is like unique, so it's almost like a fingerprint. Um, like it's it's. it's it's can be used to identify um, individuals and so and we also have speaking of localizing and we're going to talk a little bit more about the bat pinea and uh, their tra uh, tragus on it in a few slides but um, with terrestrial uh, animals most have two ears and so these are helping position uh, sounds sources through interaural and inter interaural time and inter and amplitude differences. So the delay and the amplitude differences between the ears allows us to triangulate um, where the sound source is coming from. And typically we think of, you know, a greater distance between the ears as being advantageous in order in being able to like localize that thing. But I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, and even just the oval window like this is actually um, also an amplifier. So it's like taking these smaller surface areas than the tympanic membrane. Um, so it, like you can see like, oh, the, the sound is being collected on the tympanic membrane and then like taken over to the oval win window and you get this amplification too. And it's just so fascinating. And um, the amplification, by the way, is 60 dB. It does a lot. It's not, it's not trivial at all. It's huge. Yeah. And I think you mentioned that like, so the resonant frequency of the, of the outer ear canal here, this is really what the Fletcher Munchen curve is also in part adjusting for is because that's around two Hertz or so. So that's why we're so sensitive to sounds around that area. Um, so you can see that this, you know, structure of the ear, there's, there's a, a very uh, correlation between the physicality and um, what animals are hearing in the in the in the acoustic energy world. And here, I just saw that I thought this cat was pretty cute. They have kind of amazing hearing as well. They can hear quite high frequency sounds. Um, like I think dogs and cats can both hear quite loud. I think cats actually hear quite a bit louder, or not louder, but higher frequency. Um, and then, so kind of going back to like this physicality, like look at this beautiful um, owl head and its head is almost shaped like, um, like, a, like an ear itself. So its whole head is funneling sound in and, you know, they're able to locate um, uh, their prey very, very easily. The cool thing, one of the cool things that in some, some animal, owl, owl species at least, is that their ears are positioned at different heights. And so they kind of can, that's helping triangulate where the sound sources are coming from too, just because they can kind of tell whether something's behind them a little bit more or at kind of height, 
level uh, based on like this further kind of adjustment um, kind of offset asymmetric uh, asymmetric uh, asymmetry between the two years. Um, hmm. Do you know anything else about owls that might be pertinent? Um, can kind of move on to um, that that animals aren't just hearing through their ears. This is a picture of an elephant's foot. And so the elephants are using infrasound to communicate over large differences or large di distances. I think, um, I think it's Kathy, uh, Kathy, what's her name? Uh, Kathy Payne was one of the first uh, uh, people to really prove that the elephants were using infrasound to communicate. And so they have like these, I think they're lipid filled kind of in their feet and they will spread their feet out and they'll be able to kind of uh, listen over super great distances and they'll respond to, you know, thunder and a bunch of in infrasounds um, through their feet and like spreading out these amazing um, pads of their feet. Um, and then we were talking Catherine about Payne also the way she found out about this is that she was recording with a nagra i'm not sure how many of you guys know it's basically real to real uh real to real recorder and she was recording this stuff and was she, and she was recording their their in-air sounds and as she was spooling back and forth the nagras if you guys ever work with them they uh they don't really move the tape away from the head when you do fast spooling they were very beautiful device and they had a very broad uh, uh, bandwidth that they could and she started hearing these things as she was spooling going wait a second what are what are those noises and she started uh -huh. studying it she realized it was the infrasonic uh, communication signals that these animals were using and she also noticed that um, when they were for whatever reason they would kind of get off their back legs and press their front legs into the dirt so it would maybe lift one leg off and the other almost off so they put a lot of weight so they could couple their front feet into the earth and that was uh originally finally correlated with certain types of community behavior they could hear each other over long distances like 10 15 kilometers through the earth and i think other species do that too. like i sometimes even feel like my dog is listening through its paws when it's like standing there and like has one paw up and, oh yeah a lot of insects and, do that. Yeah, a lot of thrips do that there's a lot of insect, the animals that do that now that we know that that's a behavior yeah cattle for sure i think um and that point about speeding up the infrasound so it becomes audible is um so important um in kind of our understanding of of how to interpret the inaudible world i suppose um so really uh so i, I think one of the coolest animals to be studied is is the bat and um they have some pretty interesting ears you can see they have this uh, i think it's called we have one too the targus but theirs is particularly prominent and it's really directing sound too. So it's, it's helping them kind of scan the acoustic environment and use their biosonar essentially uh, like uh, to, to be able to like catch, catch uh, insects, et cetera. Um, so Professor George Washington Pierce, I think was one of the world's first bioacousticians and he um, he was known for uh, his research on telephony, but one of his experiments, he stumbled on a method of converting supersonic sound, um, so, so ultrasonics, um, and his original apparatus, like, involved, like, I think, vacuum tubes and a telephone and, like, an oscillating crystal and a parabolic horn and, like, pieces of cardboard. And it was one of the first devices that could detect and analyze sounds above the upper limit of human hearing. So he's he's kind of an interesting um, figure in kind of in bat technologies, I suppose, and who would study bats. And uh, yeah, one of the cool things about their hearing is they're actually they're they're. Um, they can kind of see the shapes of things too, so they're like. They're using echolocation, but it's almost a form of, 
of and here we go here i go back trying to make, like making these analogies with vision but there's there's a real shape um and understanding in in the way that they're sensing the world so they can tell the shape of a fly or a leaf and they're doing this all through sound which is um quite incredible <laughs> um can i yeah. bellish on this a little bit here so you see those ridges in in the pinna and in, in the um and those ridges basically create standing waves within that cup and the tragus moves it's motile and so what they can do is they have these standing waves that are tuned to the frequency of their outgoing uh uh sound their biosonar sound it comes in and the standing wave that's within that uh the pinna that they have there is they mod they modulate that that tragus and it's really i mean it's literally i mean you see my finger moving here it's like that kind of thing and mm -hmm. through that they can actually dimensionalize the reflections of the wavelengths that are coming back and that's how they actually make the determination discrimination of what shape uh the particular thing that they're looking at is wild it, it is pretty wild um another incredible um uh animal that is sensing through not necessarily just an ear are um dolphins and um i think this is a killer whale but you can see that um so their their uh their jaw bones are like lipid filled and their jawbone is acting as a waveguide for uh, for sound in the water, and this this bullia, the auditory bullia, in my understanding, is a very hard bone, and it's helping isolate vibrations. Um, so, it kind of uh, from from their bodies. So that this is what's allowing them to have stereo hearing in the water and like why we don't really hear stereo in the water very well, apart from like the high frequency attenuation that happens there is because we're hearing a lot of it through our skull too. Um, whereas this mechanism in, in these, um, what, what are they called? Uh, Chris, Christy, I can't remember the, the, the technical name, but, um, they're actually their their jaw bones are actually attached to their inner ears in in a lot of cases which is i'm going to grab one so you can see what we're talking about because i got yeah yeah, I got yeah. please oh, please do how's everybody else doing are you are you enjoying so far <laughs> that's okay Sometimes absolutely I'm... this is fascinating yeah it's cool i you know i was, I'm, I'm an artist and i wish I was more scientifically minded, but I just am very thankful that I get to spend a little bit of time celebrating um, how cool these hearing mechanisms are and like how many different parts of the body are involved with hearing too. It's not just like, yes, the ear itself is absolutely fascinating, but you know, we have, we have um, uh, many different mechanisms involved here and like structures. And it's just so cool that these like, pan bones and the jaw of, of, of dolphins are are catching sound um i think their ears are also embedded in like a little bit of foam or something and and so that's further isolating oh here michael's got a yeah and okay so maybe i should should is, i stop my share for a second so you can yeah maybe, maybe. yeah let's let's do it really quickly yeah. uh and so i guess i need to be highlighted somehow how does this work okay, okay. so this is uh, the lower jawbone of a long nosed common dolphin. And you'd think this animal was chomping around fish and it needed to have a strong uh, jaw. Um, but if you look at the back of the jaw, there's this channel here. And all the way through that is this lipid that she's talking about. And this pan bone is actually uh, quite light. And what uh, it does is, is it transfers the sound through this acoustical lipid the auditory bulla in these animals is not fused to the skull and it's not being fused to the skull makes it a subject to vibration that's transferred to it through this lipid and so the way they hear instead of having because you know when you're diving in the water pressure gradients are going to kill you so they basically transfer all acoustical energy through this lipid and it shakes that non-fused auditory bulla and inside that 
you have, the, you know, they have the cochlea and other things that we 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 see. They don't have to have the um, the inner ear ossicles, but they have the other uh, same structures. If you look inside a human skull, um, wait just a second, I'll get one. <laughs> Does anyone have a human skull we can look at? <laughs> if you're like me, everybody, now you're wishing that he didn't have that background hiding. What else is hiding back there? <laughs> <What else is laughs> there? Okay, so this here is a human skull, and we not only have uh, our what would we call our auditory bulla, but we call it a petrous pyramid. And it's these these shaped things, one here and one on the other side here. And they're really tightly fused to the skull. And in fact, these are the densest bones in the human body. It's two and a half times the density of any other bone in the body. So it's really kind of a very <clears throat> precise, it's like when you're doing a machine shop, the heavier, the more dense, the more precise it is. So we have a whole different sense of auditory perception that's predicated on precision of a certain type. Not saying that the dolphins aren't precise, but they, uh, they are listening to things in the time domain and we're listening to things in the frequency domain. Um, but we don't want to have the time domain smeared. Um, I don't know, I want to get too complicated about this, but the difference in how that the auditory organs are contained within various animals. I'm going to bring one more here to illustrate this point. This is a harbor seal. <laughs> it's kind of fun how he disappears into the into that beautiful ocean scene. Yes. And then comes back with who knows what. Into the bone room. <laughs> um, so if you look at this, is a, this is a harbor seal. You notice how the auditory boa, which are these guys here, they're not tightly fused but they're also they're attached they're like a cantilevered so they are harbor seals are are pinnipeds, uh, pinnipeds that um the the fascina or foca they dive deep they don't have a really large above water amphibious presence um so they they can't have diaphragms like the um like the seals do I mean, the sea lions, excuse me, the sea lions have, uh, they, they have diaphragmatic ear structures that, that transmit pressure. This here, again, this is lipid surrounded and it's kind of, it's cantilevered. So this thing moves and that's what actually creates its hearing. That, you know, being said, it, it, it's, it doesn't move a lot, but if you can understand that humans can hear the movement of our tympanic membrane that is half the dimension of a hydrogen atom. So when it moves that much, so that's kind of sense. So when you have something that's cantilevered like this, you can tell that it'll hear fairly, you know, have, have a huge dynamic range in the thing. Anyways, I don't want to get too distracted on this. I want to get, get, get back to Christina, but I'm, I, I'm a skull guy, if you didn't guess. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay. Yeah, Christina. Go, yeah, good. There you go. Go back here, and how do I play? Play. I think we're are we still on the site. Yeah. So let's uh, still talking about the aquatic world. Let's go back to fish for a second. Um, I mentioned that uh, they had uh, a kind of these lateral lines. Some of them also have things called um, which is a, a, a swim bladder. So this is a air-filled resonating a chamber. And what, what happens is in these air-filled chambers, the airs compress as the acoustic e energy travels through and around the animal. Um, and it, so in some species, you'll see that the swim bladder is connecting to the inner ear. Um, and there's often an air bubble near the ear. Um, as far as we know, it's not tonotopic in the same sense as uh, humans would have a tonotopic mechanism, um, but uh, yeah, they can sense direction um, with the variable kind of uh, with like how the water is moving 
um, over these uh, swim swim bladders. And again, they, they have the sensory hairs that will move. They'll be on the outside some of the time and they'll be moving with the current um, to sense sound in the near field. And so I think the hairs on the surface resonate at a signaling frequency. Um, yeah, and they're, they're directional, so they help orient um, where, where acoustic uh, energy is coming, coming from in the environment. Um, do I have anything else on this? Uh, yeah, so they're really, again, this is particle motion. Um, and uh, we have other aquatic uh, invertebrates, such as like uh, this lobster guy and some, um, I think, octopus. Um, and so they're sensing sound, motion, and gravity in the near field by their hair cells in this lobster. It's called a statocyst, I believe. And so the statolists are um, responsible for, for the sense of like orienting themselves in space. And so um, insects also use um, these scoliopedia, I guess, which are sensitive um, bipolar nerve cells and they're found uh, directly beneath their exoskeletons in various regions. So I think they're like on this cricket. I think they're um, on the on the front legs. <laughs> so they're hearing like uh, there. They also have some interesting sound um, producing organisms. Like they'll have like one like a comb on one side, and then like uh, like some uh, like a, like a bow to to kind of make these sounds um, on the other side of their body. And then we can kind of see down here, there's like these trumpet shaped tracheal tr tubes in, the gr in this grasshopper. And they're actually amplifying sounds reaching their tympanium um, like by like tenfold. Like it's crazy how much amplification is going on. Um, so all these horn shaped waveguides are somewhat limited in bandwidth. Um, and so the diameter of the larger opening will determine kind of where the low frequency roll off is or cut off is. And, um, yeah, so, hmm. Yeah. So they have these scat scalopedia. I'm totally pronouncing that wrong. I'm so sorry, but they're attached to different uh, frequencies and, um, some of them are actually tuned to like calling and mating uh, frequencies, kind of like, like an, uh, I don't know, I think of it like an RF coordination thing, like, ah, oh, your microphone has to be on the same frequency as your, as your receiver, like, um, sort of. So I think uh, one of the per people that was studying crickets was um, Pierce again. And so he discovered that they made a lot of ultrasonic noise and um yeah he devoted a lot of his his career to to this going back to him and he determined that their vocalizations actually um were somewhat uh like a natural thermostat so they would emit like 20 chirps per second say at like 31 degrees celsius but only 16 chirps per second at 27 degrees celsius so they're kind of um very attuned to their am i Did we you lost no okay you lost we me. lost sound from christina yeah we lost I she's frozen Is it time for more bones while we vamp? More bones. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I'm going to say this: this leaf hopper, little thrip on the on the lower um, right hand corner of the screen here. These animals actually transmit sounds through the substrate of the of the of, of the leaves that they're on, and we're starting to get into that. It's, you know, in the ocean, it's benthic habitat where you have annelid worms, and um, 
other types of you know, amphipods and whatever that that all make sounds and they communicate through the mud but these leaf hoppers and a lot of other insects actually transmit sound through the leaves that they're in so they cannot be detected by predators but they can communicate to each other through whole bushes um so the beauty of that uh is that you know they're kind of quiet and you can't hear them but if we listen to them uh, as I say, studies are just happening. It sounds like the dawn chorus, and they all give space to each other. They're they're not all going at the same time because they can't do that. So different species will make sounds at different times and give each other space so they everybody can hear what's going on. And so that's a beautiful part about it. You know what's challenging about it is, for example, we're. Uh, getting into this offshore wind discussion here and on the east coast particularly uh they're doing these um turbines that are mounted into the sea floor they're they're attached to the sea floor any vibration that comes down the mast there is going to go into the substrate and there was a study by martin salon up in the north sea having to do with these these um langoustine they're little lobsters that are you know maybe yeah eight, 10 centimeters in length. And they bio-irrigate up there. They, are, they when they're good at looking for food, they're kind of digging through and the bio-irrigate it. But what they're finding is that the, the vibrations from the turbines that are going down into the substrate are stressing these animals out and is decreasing their bio-irrigation capabilities by 30%. And that means that if, I mean, these animals have been doing this since biological time. And if this area up in the North Sea, which is all mud bottom because it's all the Rhine, the Ruhr, the Thames, you know, all these rivers have been draining into this thing. If that starts settling down and becomes concrete, all the other animals, which are the foundation of the tropic pyramid down there, uh, won't be able to survive. And it's like, uh oh, you know, what do we do now? And some of this may be, uh, you know, mitigated by um, having. They're they're all gear driven up there. They're these older gear driven, and so the transmission of the of the gear uh, uh, is gear, you know the gear noise is going down in, in the substrate. But there are other noises too. Um, I hope Christina joins us again. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, uh, the 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 transmission of that noise is also creating resonances in the mast itself. So you've got all these different noises have been transmitted in the substrate into a habitat that has been biologically productive forever and it's compromising the animal's ability to do that and that's so that's what my work is is looking at the impact of anthropogenic noise on, on marine habitat so christina you're back with us Woo! Uh, sorry, my okay friend. there you go got a uh, somehow unplugged my computer i apologize i'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all right it's all right we're glad you're back yeah um did, should i finish or do you want to take over michael or do we have are we still having some time here <laughs> sure right, go ahead go anybody. ahead yeah i'm so sorry about that um i'm just reopening this i had to restart the computer um i need to get a new battery in my computer and i haven't quite made it to the oh no to do that um, well, let's ask everybody in terms of time frame. You know, we're moving in on uh, 1900 my time, and in the, if you're in Chicago, it's 21. Uh, uh, are, are people still on board, or are you wanting to head to the refrigerator? I'm in no hurry. I'm in I'm, no hurry. I want to keep going here. Yeah, keep it's going. Yeah. 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 I think I maybe have a max of 10 more minutes. So. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. And then I, and I got a short, I got like a five slide presentation about offshore wind. So, um, ah. and then we can. And we all on. agreed we're not going to tell Christina what skulls Michael showed us while she was gone. <laughs> <laughs> but I can watch the recording. <laughs> Playback. <laughs> um, I love, I love being a recording person. Um, okay. Is this plain? Is it working again? Are we yes. back? Technical well, 
Difficulties, technical difficulties. Okay, there so we are. You've, you've talked about these crickets. I wanted to go about, uh, talk about this cool little leaf hopper here. Um, and so they're using substrate borne signals um, and kind of vibrational signals transmitted th uh, through plants surfaces. So this is kind of verbal uh, vibrational communication happening uh, between two species. And so I'm a big fan of Sylvia Math Massey and about, I think in March, she posted this thing about um, plants and was asking like, what are these microphones? And so cytoacoustics is the study of how plants are responding to sound. And so some recent research um, is really, uh, actually it's fairly well established in scientific literature that plants do respond to sound. So this is, um, this is, uh, I think a Galliano and so her and another scientist's research appell has kind of robust evidence that um, plants are able to detect sound, respond to sound, and kind of distinguish ecologically relevant sounds from a mixture of um, kind of irrelevant sound frequencies. So it's not really, I think this is kind of bringing into question um, how are plants hearing without kind of ears and nerves? So there's some kind of exciting uh, research going on here. Um, yeah, so the study that, that I was reading about where the sounds kind of were emit emitting ultrasounds um, under stressed. So they used kind of contact sensors and ultrasonic microphones, focusing on a sound range uh, between 20 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz, and then counted the number of sounds that the plants emitted when kind of uh, drought, drought stress, so when not giving, get given any water, or when cut or controlled, uh, or the control group. So they get nor normally watered. Um, and then they use spectrograms of recorded sounds and audio samples in the audible range via dance down sampling and condensing those recordings in time. Um, so yeah, I think this has been kind of viewed with a lot of skepticism, but there's some pretty good science going on um, to uh, prove that even, even plants are kind of uh, involved in the inaudible world. So some future research that I think would be really cool to be able to listen to acoustic energy beyond the human hearing, hearing range would be to be using some of these specialized microphones. This is a um, AV, it's in the references uh, what microphone this is, but using these specialized like ultrasonic microphones to, to record and then kind of um, down sampling or um, uh, kind of transposing um, uh, using some circuitry and some, um, I think you can even do it in audacity, honestly, like you can kind of create a spectrogram of, of these frequencies. And then I think one of the fun things to do would be to 3D print some outer ears of the pinea and even just start there. Um, because when you think about oral architecture and you know the different sounds that we get in like a cathedral versus a arena versus a gymnasium versus you know my unacoustically treated music room, you have a bunch of different resonances going on. So even just being able to filter the acoustic energy through different kind of just these different outer filters could even allow us to hear the world um, from a different way. So it'd be kind of fun to make like binaural dummy heads of different species. And maybe like, maybe we could use some skulls in like, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, <laughs> probably work a little bit better than a 3D print just saying, um, and you know, we have, we have specialized microphones, just going back to the microphone things, in in live sound and and uh recording and film like telescopes i think we could refer to shotgun mics as telescopes and um we could refer to pickups as microphones or microscopes um and i'm sorry to use the visual analogy it's just we're such visual species um but again these are limited to the human hearing range so uh, developing electronic listening devices 
could be kind of um, interesting. And I'd love to know how you guys would want to explore the inaudible uh, world and what tools we have. And then obviously some analysis software is going to be needed for this. So preferably in the time domain. So uh, Michael uh, was talking to me about wavelet analysis and it's pretty fascinating and I have much to learn. So I don't know if he wants to speak a little bit about that, but um, yeah, the, the, the thing to keep in mind with any of this future research is, is that there are complications in knowing what animals are trying to hear, and there's just so many details involved. Um, but it's important, and why is it important? Because of these noi noise concerns, like I was talking about at the very beginning of the presentation with infrasound and ultrasound, there are deleterious effects. Um, on human and non-human life, and these are becoming quite self-evident. Um, and noise pollution is undeniably dangerous. It can really you know, lead to hearing damage, but it can also um, it can also be much more destructive than just hearing damage. And um, Michael's going to talk about that in a few in a few minutes. So, yeah, the main point is that audible to human noise pollution can cause all of these changes, and that. We could, uh, there's some work to do here, and it's fun, cool work, uh, especially if you care about other animals. And there's a list of some references um, that have informed a little bit. I want to point out like three really amazing books. Um, obviously, Michael Stalker's book, Here Where We Are, like it's, it's fabulous. I absolutely recommend this. Um, this is the one I've been reading most re recently that called The Sounds of Life, and it was just published this uh, past year, and it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so there's some, there's some really amazing literature out there. Um, Horowitz uh, wrote this book called The Universal Sense, How Hearing Shapes the Mind, and I actually I love this book too. It's kind of where I learned uh, that all vertebrates have some sense of hearing and kind of deepened my uh, my knowledge of this stuff. And I kind of want to also just say a big thank you to Dr. Logue of the University of Lethbridge, who um, he let me audit his animal communication course, which kind of led to a lot of this uh, study. And so a big, big thank you to him and Mary, of course. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Michael take it, take it over. So thanks for listening to me talk. <laughs> you know, it was so amazing. So we spent some time on Sunday kind of uh, combing through and whatever. And I, I'm just really super impressed to how you titrated. I mean, obviously, you're really super curious about the way this stuff works. And your inquisitive mind is, is uh, I mean, I was looking at her slide deck. And I'm going, we could spend about four hours on this pretty easily. And you did a beautiful job in terms of the condensing um, your, your inquiry here. So I really appreciate that. And, uh, it's, very, it's very lateral. It's not really um, super into the detail, but you know, as an interdisciplinary kind of multidisciplinary person, I kind of am very much so hoping to like create those adapters between fields so that experts can really um, communicate. Because I don't know. Please do. Yeah. We need that. We need inter interdisciplinary thinking. You know. Um, yeah. It's. I mean. Physics and biology uh, are both very amazing uh, inquiries in their particular trajectories that they're working on. Uh, the challenge is that physics uh, works, you know, in, in symbolic math and, and calculus and, and what have you, and, and biology is um, statistics. And so these guys don't trust each other because their math doesn't work the same, you know, and we need to actually bridge those particular gaps. Um, Lynn Margulis and uh, was involved in this interesting thing about biology we visited and the inqu scientific inquiry, which the metaphor that we're using is that we are basically shedding light on what is in front of us. And, and it's a visual metaphor, of course, as we shed light, the, the light expands into our surroundings and then we end up understanding everything because everything's illuminated. The problem is if you're studying biology, you're going off in one direction. If you're studying physics, another direction, you're studying behavior, another, and everybody gets off in these own directions with all their own particular lexicon and they can't understand each other. 
And so what Margulis was talking about is that we should look at inquiry as uh, a circle that surrounds the mystery in the middle. And so I'm sitting there as a, a marine bioacoustician. That's something I don't understand. I go around to where the, um, uh, well, you know, the shaman is, for example, the physicist over here or the mechanical engineer. And I ask, you know, what does it look like from your position? So instead of trying to illuminate the, the surrounding around us, assuming that what we know is, is um, fidelitous to truth, we are understanding that the mystery is in the center and we'll probe into that. And if we can share uh, in within each other's vocabularies, un understanding that we're all part of the same circle, that we're going to become to a, a greater understanding of this. And her book was uh, Biology Revisions. And it, I think it's 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 worth a, a gander. Um, can I share my screen here? It looks like I can. And which is the one I want to do here? I think it's this one. I should share the sound as well. And I should probably go back to the beginning. Nope. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go back to here. And um, I will expand this to slideshow. Oh, it's operating slow from the beginning. There we go. Okay. So, um, what we do is we look at the impacts of human generated noise on marine habitat and expanding that to in the impacts of human enterprise on uh, on marine habitats. And uh, the last administration, we were working hot and heavy on offshore oil uh, production and trying to basically quell that and managed to successfully stop the, pre the the development of offshore oil in the South Atlantic. I was working with um, Oceana and uh, Southern Environmental Law Center and Surfrider and a couple other groups, but we were really on this and we managed to actually throw sticks into the wheels of that particular trajectory and, and, and stopped it, thank God. Um, but, but I didn't think, you know, this next administration was going to be a lot more environmentally friendly. Uh, the offshore wind thing started coming up. And um, the challenge with this is that, you know, it's a balance of harms issue. You can't just unplug the pipeline and plug in the power cable and then you're done if you're heading the same direction you were heading before. So one of the many problems that I've come up with, and this is going to intersect with Christina's uh, inquiry about infrasound, is, is what infrasound is, what is generated by this particular technology. Um, these things... Uh, are large you don't really have to deal with them that much in in chicago area but off the eastern seaboard they're um okay how are we going to do this one page down there next one okay if you can see this is a 14 megawatt generator and this is like 150 people these things are gargantuan this is a a blade of one of the largest turbines here to give you an idea of the size of these things um this is that actually is is obsolete now. Uh, you're in Chicago, the Willis Tower. This one actually, the Hall, uh, Halley X is is still. I mean, they're, they're talking about a, a thousand feet. It's going to go up to a thousand feet. So if you can imagine one of these, I, I need to get my communications person to do this in the skyline so you can see what's going on. But you can get the idea of the size. They're gargantuan, and the problem that we have is that these blades are traveling okay if you have a, a blade that's 120 meters you know a, 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 rot a rotor that's 120 meters or, or 150 meters across those tip tips are moving at a high velocity i mean they're moving at like 350 kilometers an hour they look like they're going slow but because they're so large you know that, that's why they're looking at the slow and so they're creating among other things these tip vortices that essentially collapse and when they collapse they create these pops and you can see this kind of stuff here and you can hear it here i think I'm... everybody knows this one but, um, those large turbines create the same noise except it's at lower frequency so this is uh uh, a model image, this is a mathematical model image of, of a tip 
vortice off of one uh, tip from a stationary standpoint. Um, and so they're creating these, we'll get out of here, they're creating this noise. So this is a study, uh, Edwards et al. Uh, analysis of wind turbines, uh, seismic noise. This is a seismic side, but he basically had four pretty small three megawatt uh, turbines. This is terrestrial, and um, and he measured the noise of this. Uh, and this is dbre one pascal. So if you want to get into twenty micropascals, which is what we measure a terrestrial noise, and you're going to add sixty three dB to this. Okay. That's, you know, 63 dB is, is a loud office space, but it's this low frequency noise we're talking about, which is right here, it's 0.1 hertz. That's the, the extent of their, um, of their measurement. But this energy is still going up. Um, so, you know, how far does it go up? What kind of, and oh, by the way, so this, this is based, when they sample this, they're not just measuring with a, you know, a, a sound level meter like you and I would normally use they're integrating over 30 seconds so that's how they can get an uh, an, an average at 0.1 hertz that is consistent with the energy that's been propagated into the environment getting back to what christina was saying about our curves our m rated uh m weighted or a weighted curves all these things start cutting cutting off at 20 to 10 to 20 hertz and so by the time you actually are into this energy, you're 24 to 30 dB down because they're talking about anywhere from six to, to, you know, two to three pole filters that are essentially knocking this stuff down so that it looks like it's okay. But um, this is what was marvelous about this particular study and terrifying to me, frankly, uh, was that they didn't, they didn't come at, they came to it as seismologists and not as audio, you know, acousticians or audio people. Um, so, and this is two, two and a half kilometers from the closest mast. Five kilometers, we also have, um, you know, significant noise. At 10 kilometers in these particular smaller turbines, it's not so bad. But 10 kilometers, we'll show you later. Okay, so this here is another component of the noise. All these resonances, these are band passes or, or blade passes. These resonances are the torsional res resonances of the actual mast itself. So, and they're, they're, you know, they're not that, they're in the one, two, three, five hertz, you know, range. So they're, they're not that, what you call infrasonic, but they're below what humans call, uh, you know, what we can, we can, the pitch, you know, pitch discrimination of human beings. So um, herein lies the problem. There are migrating birds. This happens to just be uh, waterfowl, which are geese and ducks and whatever, uh, that are sensitive to low frequency energy. They're, they're sensitive for a couple of different reasons. One, from a navigational standpoint, uh, you know, if they're flying along the coastline, the waves crashing along the shore give them these pulses that they can use to help orient towards this idea of, of um, a shoreline. Uh, pigeons are a great example. Of this. I mean, homing pigeons, for example, how they they have these homing pigeon races uh, that they run. And these animals, how do they figure out where the hell they are? Well, one of the things they do, if you watch pigeons, they will uh, circle a lot. And as they circle, they are uh, able to perceive, if you do the math on the thing, um, Doppler shifts at incredibly long wavelengths. So at, at point five hertz and they're circling at you know 13 um a, a meters a second which is not uncommon there's a five percent sh uh, frequency shift at that wavelength and they can sense where something is coming from so they're creating community ear as a group of flocking pigeons when they're flying around in these circles and so they can actually localize uh things like wind blowing across um uh mountain ridges for example or the waves things that i mentioned before and other uh interactions geological uh interactions between you know, the wind and or in the ocean uh, with waves and things like that um so they sense that but now this is a basically a wind farm and these this is a, a kilometer down here and so this is you know it's like 100 square kilometers these animals are avoiding it 
okay, you say they're not getting hit by the by the blades, which is a good thing, but they are losing a hundred square kilometers of habitat that they otherwise feed in. I got a problem with that. Um, let's see if I got these other things. So is it, this is so. This is called the Atlantic Flyway, and we have birds that come from South America, Central South America, all the way down from the Arctic, Antarctic, excuse me. Um, and they fly up this flyway here, and they use these infrasonic navigation cues to get around. One of the other things that they use is when uh, the barometric pressure is fluctuating rapidly, it's an unstable uh, weather front, and they don't want to get up in it because they're going to be buffeted by oncoming winds but when they have a consistent drop in bar, uh, in barometric pressure then they say oh let's get up in front of it because we have a tailwind you know we can get five thousand miles out of this sucker and uh if you have that particular bandwidth infrasonic bandwidth cluttered with that helicopter sound are they going to be able to perceive it what's going to be the response we don't know uh, do I have the whales on here? Okay, so this is where they're planning um, wind farms on the Atlantic seaboard. Um, and they're all big. So they want to have 30 gigawatts of energy pulled out of the uh, out of the air. You know, when you pull 30 gigawatts of air energy and turn it into electrical energy, you guys know this stuff. It doesn't do the wind energy thing. And it's already, you know, it's, that energy is sapped out of it. So all the other things that that wind energy does is going to be attenuated. Okay, do I have the whales on here? Oh, yeah, because this is another situation here. So their long wavelength, we're talking about 0.1 to 0.05 hertz in this particular model. If you look at um, the boundary between the air and the water, the higher the frequency, uh, the, the more uh, opaque that is, but the lower the frequency is. So if you do this here and you do 0.1 hertz, you're talking about a, a translational loss of negative 24. I mean, it's, you know, it's, all these numbers are arbitrary. You're talking about these wavelengths, which if you go up here, you know, this is the seismic stuff. It's shaking the earth. It's going to shake the water down here. So you have uh, whales that also use infrasonic energy to get their navigation cues, either through their own outgoing low frequency vocalizations or phonations, we're calling them now because they don't come through vocal cords. And they bounce them off of things and they determine where they are, or they're getting, again, the same thing with the, the, the infrasonic energy off of the waves hitting the beach, um, seismic stuff, geological activity. They know where they are because of this infrasonic energy. It's their, their navigation cues. And if we're going to clutter this up with all this wacky noise, you know, I'm going to go back here again. This is that, you know, these animals, the, the North Atlantic right whale and the and humpback whales migrate along here. And they're also, uh, you know, the other rorquals, you know, the blue whales and the fin whales and sea whales. Um, and they need to know where they are. They, you know, they can't see uh, in in the turbid waters where they are, and it's certainly not navigating by by stellar. And, and they could have magnetic sense. We don't know. There's no way you can test these animals. And you know, when these animals are large. You can't really tell actually what they can and can't hear. But you know, when an animal vocalizes at four hertz, it can probably hear that. Um, you're not going to sit these guys in an aquarium and, you know, do operant conditioning testing on them. It's like hit the paddle when you hear this and we'll give you a ton of krill. So, uh, so we have this problem. Okay. So what I'm arguing right now is that while we need to bet the pivot off of uh, fossil fuel to pivot directly to energy generation substitution through wind is problematic because we actually need to use less energy. And I'm getting into trouble with my uh, conservation colleagues like NRDC and, and Audubon and what have you, because I'm suggesting that we need to use less energy. They're not on board with that because they're working with uh, re Renewable Energy Wildlife Institute, which also includes people like ExxonMobil and BP. And all. So the, the greenwashing thing that's going on there, that's that's going to be the um, the shocking revelation of my chat here but if you look what's you know what's going on in europe i don't know if you guys go to europe very often 
but these are all public rail systems in in Europe. And Spain has got over three thousand miles of high speed rail. In the United States, we don't quite have 198 miles of high-speed rail, and this is all the public rail. So my message um, and why I joined, well, one of the reasons I joined on board of this is because I want to convey this, that we need to actually use less energy, and that'll save us from uh, a grisly fate. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. This is that book that she was talking about. I'm going to plug this mercilessly. Um, but thanks a lot. I, I hope uh, I hope you got something out of that. Absolutely, wonderful stuff. Yes, Thank everyone unmute and clap. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Thank you for the work you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah if you if you have time for questions, we, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, no, I'm I'm here. You know, yeah. I think. Um, I think Levon had a question in the chat. He was asking just what the mast is, and it's just like the base of the of the windmill. So when the propellers are like, I think they're called propellers. When they're hitting this, you're getting these big compression waves, right? So, uh, so the way this works, you've got a mast, you've got a generator mounted on a mast, um, and you've got the blades in front of it. Uh, in front of the mast, you have what's called stagnant air because the wind's blowing towards that and you get this bubble of stagnant air. When the blade intersects that, it creates a pop. That's just one of the noises. The other is, a, is the tip vortices, which, which we hear with a helicopter. The helicopter doesn't have this mass issue. So you have these noises. What is, it, you know, that is all integrated into that low frequency, you know, infra, infrasonic sound. And, you know, we're talking about something that's hitting at high speed that and at 300, Foot, you know 100 120 meter um rotor width that's happening like once every two seconds at high speed maybe three seconds so we're talking about you know 0.05 to 0.0 you know 0.03 to 0.05 hertz and um and that's infrasonic energy that is at a micro barom barometric pressure level and at and those energies the same kind of energy we're talking about that an oncoming storm we have. When you have a thousand of these turbines planted along the coastline and they're all creating these thumping sounds, uh, we don't know. We have no idea. It's a it's a laboratory. And unfortunately, because we are, I, I, I got into this because I am collaborating with all these other environmental groups and, and contributing what I can to do critiques on environmental impact statements as they're being submitted that try to, understand that we need to mitigate we need to do baselining we need to um, have what they call a, adaptive management so when we start seeing there's a problem we are able to say okay well how are we going to solve this problem now we need to predict these problems and that's the thing that they're avoiding and um because when you have you know a factory that turns out you know 15 megawatt generators and all the other stuff involved in that stuff you're not going to say hold it everybody the whales are not liking this they're not going to stop though the, the the momentum is too great so can all I... right i think i think tom has a question <laughs> he's always got a good one I was just going to ask about the uh, interact, the overlap between shipping noises and turbine noises. Are they in the same frequency range, or are the shipping noises a lot higher frequency? Uh, they're a little bit higher, uh, but a friend of mine was uh, dropping a hydrophone in uh, in one of the uh, um, area off the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and he was listening to the Ben Franklin come up. Ben Franklin is one of the largest cargo ships in the known universe and he was hearing a five hertz oscillation when this ship was down in monterey which is like uh probably 70 or 80 miles maybe more than that 100 miles south and he heard this ship coming up that far away so that's shipping noise um so there's an overlap there we're going to go the other end of the spectrum here uh 
another colleague of mine from JASCO was recording up in the uh, Puget Sound area for the uh, the southern resident killer whales that are up there, which are really under serious pressure right now. And he kept on getting this like really loud 30 kilohertz noise. It's like 30 kilohertz. And this is in the sweet spot of where the biosonar is for these animals. And where was that noise coming from? There's an anti-fouling system, which is now just out of the box and is all over the place. And they basically put these transducers on the hulls of boats and they blast it with high energy, 30 kilohertz, so in the 25 to 30 kilohertz range. And it what they're saying is it creates bubbles through microcavitation. And that um, that kind of discourages uh, adherence of, you know, barnacles and other stuff to the hull. But the issue is barnacles can hear up there. So they may be avoiding it from a from a biotic standpoint and not necessarily from a physics standpoint. And this is huge. I mean, this is not some this is not something that's come out of somebody's garage. I mean, the, the, this is the shipping industry is into it up to their elbows at this point in time. And this is really where all the Adana seats, you know, it's all of a sudden having, you know, a, a car alarm all the time in your house and you can't turn it off because it's somebody else's problem so i'm uh i'm not getting too depressed but i'm i work on not <laughs> so. but yeah the the, the shipping you know, the ocean is 10 times louder now it's probably 12 times louder now there's a guy named donald ross who did what's called the Ross projection. And he saw what was going to be occurring as we globalized trade. And in his baseline was 1964. And then we started globalizing trade through those years. And in 50 years after that point, the noise in the ocean from shipping noise alone increased by 10 dB. So 10 times louder. And is this a problem? Another colleague, uh, Susan Parks, who works at UPenn, has a lab up in Bay of Fundy, and she was um, recording the North Atlantic right whales and, you know, basically doing studies on those animals. And there was a woman who was using her lab for a while, also Rosalind Rowland, who was measuring the stress hormones in the feces, the cortisol levels in the feces of these animals. She had this dog that could smell well poop. You know, and then they had these little Avons that going around and what's over there. And so she was scooping up this whale feces and measuring the cortisol levels in it. And then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, if you guys recall, they shut down shipping in the ocean for about a week. And the cortisol levels went down a lot. And then when they started the shipping, the cortisol levels went up. So, that, you know, you don't have this correlation, which is pretty hard to dispute. Wow, uh, Nathan, I have an, I have a feeling he's somewhere where he can't open his mic. So he asks, uh, "Excellent talk, Michael. May I, I may have missed it, but do the offshore wind farms affects any sea animals along with the birds?" Well, uh, the ocean is an acoustic environment, and the noises that these things create are manifold from the very beginning to the end. Uh, when they have to survey for you know where they want to put these things they want to determine what kind of the substrate is if it's rock if it's um if it's mud if it's sandy if it's gravel so they do these surveys and the surveys are uh you know side scan and, and our, um and synthetic aperture sonar usually between uh 40 hertz and 100 kilohertz um 40 40 kilohertz 100 kilohertz just scanning and stuff um and then they want to get more into it. They have these things called sparkers, which get, get these pops off, or they have seismic air guns, or small ones, because they don't really need to go that deep, but they're pops. Um, and all these things are, are, you know, they're on mobile platforms, so they can't really attenuate them. They're constantly making this noise. When they find an area that they want to, uh, in the East Coast, because you're not getting too much deeper than 100 meters there, uh, you can actually create structures. There's various um, jacket bases and gravity bases and whatever, but they basically, a lot of them depend on 
pile driving. So they drive these piles in and they mount the, the piles. Well, these piles are not like the piles you see when you go down to the beach or to the, the, the port. They're anywhere from a meter in diameter to over 12 meters in diameter. And they have these big hammers that drive those things in. Okay, so that's not a formula for quiet. What they've done is they've uh, come up with these systems of attenuating. One of us is, a, is these nets of Hemmel's resonators that basically, you know, and they can pull the noise down by as much as 30 dB um, and, uh, and bubble curtains. But you still have this pile, you know, okay. So the guy uh, who's got his, uh, his, what are these kind of mufflers that go blah, 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 blah. okay so instead of being right in your driveway he, he drives you know 30 yards down the road but he's still noisy it's a noise it's not natural and when we're talking about regulations we're talking about noise exposure thresholds that that pull in regulatory compliance if we did residential noise control predicated on how loud something was only we would live in a completely different setting we have annoying noises and we have not annoying noises if somebody's in you know the next door he's got a great jazz band playing and you know it's and it's violating the the 55 db at the property line threshold i don't have a problem with that but if this if this jerk has got a you know a giant engine that's like <laughs> all the time it's like ah, stop it so, but we're regulating strictly on amplitude alone. So, I mean, that's, it was, I'm on my soapbox. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. Let's, uh, uh, you know, because we ended with Michael, um, you know, we're, let's, uh, I'm challenging everyone to questions for Christina. <laughs> um, let, let's let's go back to all that wonderful content and yeah, uh yeah i got a question um how excellent. has your research into the world of animal hearing affected your theremin performances have has there been any interrelationship there yeah that's kind of the topic of my main thesis so um my supervisor dr Ellen shirts is is the head of the music department so i've never really considered myself a musical person, but I've been doing live sound for music for, you know, 15 years or something. So I know a lot of um, incredible uh, musicians and kind of listening to these soundscapes and, and these sounds that animals are producing um, has really kind of, I don't know, the theremin's just such an interesting instrument to interact with the natural uh, kind of soundscapes. And so sometimes I'll like I'll try and mimic these like like whale sounds are just so beautiful to listen to and like play along to and it's like I'm not expecting to be like communicating, um, but it's a way to deeply listen to um, soundscapes and and kind of the thing about the theremin that I like so much is kind of that it's a kind of a gestural thing so it's very tactile and kinetic too and um although there's this kind of you know interesting analogy between like the invisible world and the inaudible world and like not having like the theremin's non-mechanical so you're not touching it at all and i think that kind of works as an interesting analogy for for the inaudible world and also kind of like how we can connect and then that it's such a physical um instrument as well that you have to move to play it kind of uh kind of yeah it's just a good way for me to deeply listen mm -hmm. and interact with these sounds and engage with these sounds so it's i think it's definitely affected my hobby my <laughs> native sound making practice and here's another great question from Levon. Um, I'm hoping to do further research. I mean, I'm looking forward to defending my my thesis, and we'll see what the what happens in the future. It would be great to you know do some do some more studies. I feel very very privileged. Like um, in a sense, there was a silver lining for COVID and me because I was a full time 
um, AV person with the Calgary Stampede, which is kind of also like I was at the Agrium there, almost every Stampede, and that's really where I started um, thinking about hearing and animals because we would have, you know, the the sheep and the horses and the cattle and all these animals, and I was kind of fairly conscious of 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 you know how loud I was getting and and you know looking at how like or watching and listening to how these animals were responding to sound and, and being in the space and um yeah so I, I i i'm very glad that in a sense i got this opportunity to go to university and kind of get a get a second degree and maybe i can do more studying in the future it's been pretty pretty great well this is this has been wonderful um fascinating stuff fascinating um we we have i i think we're wrapping up here mm -hmm. <laughs> we do have one if you'll indulge us in a little tradition we have a little little presentation um so let's see brandon if you can uh you know line up me and our our yeah, guests so let's see the best thing to do is those who are not uh carrie or the presenters if you could turn your videos off uh-huh and okay. here is we'll be we'll be sending along your certificates and AES mugs. Thank you. I, I, I got to make sure my mug is still in it. <laughs> An AES mug, that's great. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. We're running out of them. We, we it may look slightly different as we're having to reorder. Um, but that could be a good thing because we weren't entirely pleased with how the last batch came out. So, <laughs> but really, this has been more. wonderful. It's if an it's honor logo, to. It's bragging yeah. rights for me. Yeah, it's great. There it's you great. go. There you go. Thank you. Well, it, it's it's been an honor and just like wow, fascinating work you're doing, and thank you for the work you're doing. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting and and uh, like yeah, deeply compelling um uh just yeah thank you for, for for this for being with us tonight this has been i think uh i think everybody has has enjoyed this so um yeah so thank you okay. everyone and, and maybe you. the next time it'll be uh space microphones uh, the, uh... <laughs> there you go there you go yeah. the stratosphere yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you each and every one of you and uh good luck with the work you're doing and uh I hope to hear about it. Thanks so yeah, much. Be well, be well. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.